So I speak about the Raman portfolio, about source, which is a, a specific Raman technique, um, and about uh, something which we have really brand new, which is the via handheld Raman. Um, this history of Raman is relatively long, but it's still a, a brand new instrument, but also still a brand new company, which was Cobalt in Oxford in UK. And this was bought by Agilent now three years ago. And they gave us, if you like, all, all the Raman portfolio. Very quickly, I have a very quick overview for you about what I'm responsible for, which uh, is the molecular spectroscopy um, business. And then I will have a very quick uh, Raman introduction so that everybody is on the same page. What is Raman doing? Why is it used for raw material testing and other things? And that you have an idea. And then I will introduce this spatial offset Raman, which is something relatively new, maybe 15 years old, and I explain why and what um, it can do. And then I will introduce the VIA, the rep ID, and a bit about the TRS-100. But very quick, give me, let's say, 20 seconds that you have an idea what I'm responsible for inside of Agilent, which is the UV-Vis, UV-Vis near and fluorescence part. Uh, this is the overview. Um, we have a Carry 60, which is the workhorse for ultra low maintenance. You know, this lamp is for 10, 20 years in the same instrument without doing PQ and, and doing uh, um, yeah, changing of lamps. We have something brand new for UV-Vis, which as you probably know, no other um, supplier anyway is doing any more to invest in something new for UV-Vis. We are doing this. It's complete new hardware, uh, special source, and also the best compliance features um, for, for running a pharma business with UV-Vis. We have something where reference instrument is needed, which we call the, the high-end series. 100 kilograms and really double monochromator if you need the best of the best. And we have Eclipse, and if you're working maybe on, on monoclonal antibodies, they are something where we can follow and monitor monoclonal antibody aggregation very fast with fluorescence. FTIR, and this is something I don't cover today, is something we have some workhorse, some mobile things if you would like to measure FTIR wherever you are, in the desert, in the plain, somewhere. We have something around cleaning verification, a really let's say burning technique where we can do much faster the cleaning verification of, of vessels which is something where we see a lot of interest from, from big pharma companies. So we just measure the surface, the metal, and we can say, oh, there's two microgram of your API still on the metal surface, or no, the metal is clean, you can, you can run your next batch. Really interesting and, and um, promising. And we have chemical imaging where you can see what is where on a tablet. So you cut your tablet in the middle and you can say, oh, the crystallization, or let's say the crystal size is maybe not ideal, or the API is not right mixed. This is what with a quantum cascade laser can be done. And, and very quickly, the Raman portfolio, this is what I will cover today. We have a TRS-100 transmission Raman, a rep ID, and mainly the VIA, which is the, the main talk today. Um, okay, this is that. So Raman spectroscopy. Um, well, everything goes back to, to this guy, and this is roughly 100 years away or 100 years ago, which was Sir uh, Chandrasekhara Raman. And he is the man behind the Raman. So he published a, 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 a paper or an article in Nature, and, and he won the Nobel Prize for finding this um, Raman effect, so-called Raman effect. And what the Raman is, and what we are doing here, is we are using a strong monochromatic light source. So in, in Raman's time, of course, it was maybe a mercury lamp or something. Um, but nowadays it is a laser and you irritate the sample and the resulting, the scattering of the light we can be used or, or it can be used to analyze and to get a fingerprint of your sample to identify what it is. And normally it's a vis laser, so it is a laser in the range, let's say 380 to um, 780, 800 nanometers or above, which is then the NIR laser. We, for example, are using an 830 nanometer laser, which for us is the best compromise in not seeing too much fluorescence, but still giving an enough scattering so that you can identify things. Nobody else is really using this, but we decided this many years ago, and we, we are running very well with this. Important is also that the Raman effect, so the scattering, is really, really low. So this is why we need sensitive detectors on one side, reduce fluorescence on the other, and also have a good source um, with a lot of power. Okay, so very quickly, um, as I said, this is just the intro that we are all on the same page. We have a molecule, which is maybe a raw material. You put the laser on top, 
um, and the laser, as I said, VIS or NIR laser. And then you see two different effects. So number one is the elastically scattered light. And you see this, It's if this is a green laser, this is, has the same color, which is green. So it's the same energy and same, oh, no change in energy. And, and then you, what we have is a Raman um, effect. And as you've seen, a very low amount or percentage of the, of, the, of the laser photons are having this effect. This is the inelastically scattered things. And this can be short or longer wavelengths. And with this one, we can, we can see the Raman effect. And this is used um, later on to, to analyze some, um, some materials in general. So the good thing is Raman is complementary to FTIR. I'm sure you've, you've heard this before. Just to visualize this a bit, I have a, a picture where you can see both. So the IR is more tending to emphasize the polar functions or polar groups inside of your molecule, where Raman a bit more going on the aromatic and carbon. And just to see this, this is PET, polyethylene terephthalate, and you see a bit that, for example, the, the ring here, the stretching, you see a big Raman signal from the, from the bone, from the backbone here, um, where you see nothing in the infrared. And, you know, you see a bit, they're complementary, you're getting complementary information, but the good thing is Raman and FTIR, they're Boeing, go, bo, both going to, to function groups. So in comparison to NIR, if you think about raw material testing with NIR, this is, you see the overtones, you see the broad bands, and you don't have the yeah, selectivity, if you like, that you see the function groups. So this is why Raman and I, mid-infrared, are definitely um, good to, to raw material testing. So Raman spectroscopy identify both organic and even inorganic compounds. So if you have, I don't know, potassium, um, or calcium carbonate in, 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 yeah, in, 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 as your raw material, yes, Raman can do this easily. Yeah, it, it can be applied to a range of material types, it requires minimal sample preparation. This is the general words around spectros Raman spectroscopy. And if we go a bit more in detail what Raman um, is doing, or what Raman, the different, um, let's say, setups, we have four different yeah, setups, which you can see here. So the first one is the classical backscattering Raman. So you have a laser, you shot on the surface, and the Raman effect, these, these um, arrows here, are going back um, to your detector because your detector sits somewhere here. This is what the competition is doing. So all handheld Raman, maybe you have already some in your lab or in your warehouse, maybe not, but everything um, which is now handheld Raman on this planet is um, classical backscattering Raman. Um, the next thing, and as I said, we are speaking today about spatially offset Raman. This is something similar in general, but you can see the arrow is not anymore coming directly on the same spot like where the detector sits. I will explain this in detail. We're sitting a bit spatially offset. And this is why you see here, the, the laser goes more deeply inside of the molecule, or let's say in, in, inside of the container and we can, we can measure the, the source effect. And for this, we have these two um, systems here. Then we have transmission Raman. So you have your laser here and you put your detector after. So it's a classical transmission thing. And this is where we, or what we use for, for our TRS-100. I will explain what the instrument can do. Surface enhanced Raman, maybe you've seen this during university or R&D, so this is nothing we are covering. It's more for, for R&D and, and research work. If we now jump to the VAYA and um, a, a bit more, I'm sure you all are aware when you think about checking raw materials, where well, there's the GP, um, GMP guidance for active pharmaceutical ingredients, and you see immediately, and you know this better than me, you know, the material should be held in quarantine, and then you can check and test it and appropriate and release it for use. And normally um, it should be tested, you know, if, if you have the right product in your box, in your sack, in your, in your package. And at least one test to verify the identity and Raman is a possible thing to do this. Um, so the traditional way, and I will depict a bit how it is do, done now and with a via, with a source, you will see later on that this is not anymore the way it should be. And we are speeding this up significantly. So the traditional way, and this is how you do this for sure um, today, maybe with a handheld Raman a bit different, but at least the goods arriving at the loading bay, normally it's put then in a quarantine area. And the traditional way that you put it in a dedicated area for sampling. So if you have, let's say, these paper sacks, for sure you're putting your, your 
your your palette or your your stuff here in your um, sampling area removing or opening the paper taking out some samples and if you if you're running it um, and uh, root n plus one so from 100 sex you are um, examining um, 11 this is fine we see a lot of trends especially in, in asia but also in europe and, and, and in other countries um, that the people are going to 100% inspection. So if you have 100 sacks, you're inspecting 100. If you think about opening 100 sacks, I'm sure you can quickly calculate how long it will take. And we can see this later on that this is not needed anymore. Nevertheless, you take your samples, you bring them in a QC test laboratory. Maybe you use an Agilent HPLC, maybe you use different techniques, maybe you use FTIR or Rama. And then you release everything in production. So this is how it works now. Takes quite long. So think about 100 sacks of glucose you would like to check. This takes easily one or one and a half days. So now we are explaining, or I'm explaining, we are looking a bit more on the spatially offset Raman. So spatially offset Raman called source is something which is not brand new, but it's relatively new. It was invented by Professor Pavel Matusek, and he was in Oxford um, a professor. And his idea was at this time, 2004, 15 years ago, to measure a clean Raman spectrum from something independently from the container material. So his idea was to look through packaging. Um, and his idea was, and he, he made a nice paper, which you can see, I think, here on the side, is, um, which was on the applied spectroscopy in 2005. And he found out that this is working. So you can measure even through diffusely scattering paper remember my glucose and the paper yes we can measure through that even to fluorescing containers and um, this source system can be done and nobody else has source so Agilent is unique in using source for 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 this type of pharmaceutical applications so how does source works very very easy so you have a white hdpe container and when you have this um, you have something inside which is your content which is depicted blue here you have the detector um, above and what you first do is you or we we have a look first on the Raman spectra of the pure materials so the pure HDPE looks like this and the pure content um, looks like um, the blue spectrum and and when you do a, a classical Raman backscattering experiment so this is what you get from all your handheld Raman devices on this planet what you get is you shoot your laser on the surface you mainly see, and this is what you see in this, we call it a zero offset measurement because the detector sits without any offset above your laser spot. You see that you see the container. More or less only the container is giving you the signal. You see this tiny guy here? Yeah, this is your guy, um, your spectrum, uh, your peak from here. You see the small peak here. Yeah, you see a bit of your pure material. And this depends, of course, on the thickness here, depends on the laser. Maybe one supplier is better, maybe the other one is worse. But you get this. What we are getting this as well. So we are taking the zero offset measurement. We're taking this on the side inside of the, the instrument. And then what we are doing is we are movingly spatially away the laser. And you see now in the, in the animation here that this peak here, the further we are moving the laser away, and you can also read this in the paper I've, I've shown to you. Um, the more we are moving, there's an ideal di distance, an I ideal difference between these spots. You get something which we call the spatially offset measurement. And you see immediately that the container signal, so the container material and Raman spectrum is still there. Yes, you still see the peaks, the, the triplet or the three peaks here, but it's, it's significantly suppressed. Uh, suppressed sorry and this is what you do and then you take these two spectra and just automatically of course the system is doing this without any interaction from you subtracting this you make a, a quick scaling factor again automatically done by the software and then you get your so-called source results and you see immediately and you remember good enough for sure that this is exactly what it is inside of your your htp container and this is how source works so you measure a, a zero offset a spatial offset, subtract them. And no, as again, nobody is doing this. It's a unique um, feature which we do. And just as an example, so what we have here is sucrose in a 1.5 millimeter polypropylene container. So what you do, you measure 
first uh, the reference so this is the polypropylene reference so this is the Raman signal of polypropylene this is what you would get with when you use your handheld which you have now on your lap um, you see as you see immediately the polypropylene and this is what you get with the source so you see this uh, signal nice spectra good quality and you can make a guess how long we are measuring I'm not sure how you how long you are normally measuring when you're checking your raw materials this takes three seconds so in three seconds you get the quality spectra like this and the is it green yes the green spectrum on the on the bottom shows you um the sugar reference so this is what the the, the sucrose um, spectrum look like you see immediately that this is a perfect fit and this is working quite nice um, so this is how source is working and now I can show you a bit more about this new VIA. We call it VIA, the handheld Raman instrument. Um, what it is, it is a handheld instrument. It looks like you can see on the right hand side. It is to verify um, the solid and liquids if this is the right product inside of your packaging. It can scan of course like any other through transparent tr tr containers but it also worked through non-transparent containers. This is the huge and big difference you can see. Of course, it's ready for the pharmaceutical industry. We have sold already a couple worldwide. It is 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. You have USP and EP compliance, of course, inside. You have two batteries. Uh, one is for four hours. So if you have the other one um, is for another. So you have eight hours working time with the batteries provided. Lightweight, so it's um, roughly a bit of about 1.5 kilograms. There's a barcode scanner. I will show you later where it sits. At the end, what you can do is you can, you have quite often, not always, um, on your raw material, let's say on your glucose in the, um, in the, the paper sack, you have a barcode from the producer in China and in India, wherever you get it from. Um, what you can do is you can set up your method with the VIA and you connect this uh, with the barcode on your paper sack. And then later your co-workers or yourself, whoever is using the instrument, just scans in half a second the barcode on the paper sack, and then it's automatically loaded the right method for you to run um, your raw material identification. Of course, all the data management system integration is done where you can have a network connection or you can use a, a Wi-Fi connection. It can be connected to a LIMS. You can back up all your data and, and all type of reporting can be done, batch reporting, of course, as well for your raw material. So what the instrument is made for is for raw material identification, verification. So you get from your, again, dextrose or glucose in a paper sack, an answer, yes, pass. This is, the, I'm assuming that it is inside the right thing, or no, you get something which is a fail. Of course, normally when you're getting 100 sacks of glucose from India, you're expecting that the 100 of these sacks are glucose inside. And I'm pretty sure in 99.99% .99 of the cases, it is correct. So nobody packed the wrong sack on this pellet. But of course, um, still it can happen so then you get a failure but normally of course it's pass is the the answer you're getting yeah as i said 21 cfr 11 compliance you have all these login password you know password aging complexity of the name audit trail data is protected against deleting everything is included you have a system check where you can verify the instrument health against usp 1120 or european uh, usp or ep can be triggered automatically at the beginning of a batch or at the end of a batch that you, that you always know that during the whole batch testing process the instrument was working fine and you have something like a method development and validation so you you make your method on your own it depends on your on your challenge if you like on your combination out of a the raw material on one side and the packaging on the other side um, how long it will take so a couple of minutes maybe and and then you can get um, this type automatically validated and then you have a validated method to run your tests so again just uh, in, in some pictures transparent containers you see this polyethylene bags very easy glass vials or polymer vials very easy brown bottles still very easy this everybody can do. So this is what, what the majority of the handheld Raman systems can do. We can do this significantly faster. We know this. We are significantly faster than any other instrument, neither NIR or um, 
Raman handheld. Um, and we can even do difficult things. Let's say PS20, PS80 in brown bottles could be quite tricky to do. Um, we know that this works perfectly in, in the short time. But again, what we can do, what others can't, uh, for example, these yellow sacs here, where you have some, some glucose or some dextrose monohydride inside. You have this polyethylene HDPE uh, barrels where something is inside. And you can see we can even measure through paper. So this is the product manager somewhere in South Korea um, testing triple layer paper sacs. And yes, this works as well quite fine. And this is the, the big difference. So instead of opening all these bags, instead of opening all this packaging here, we measure through, which is significantly faster. And again, we are, we are checking this. Is this really what is inside truth? And of course, there are many points around this non-opening of things. Um, and you remember this picture from the beginning. This is how it works when you use a VAYA or maybe a rep ID. The goods are arriving. You put it in the quarantine area, of course, for holding testing. You make all the tests, you test 100, 100 um, paper sacks, maybe if you multiply it with 20 seconds or 15 seconds, you get the right answer and you release it into production much faster than anything else. And speed is, of course, a money saving. But of course, you have some other, well, let's say simplifying and positive effects. Reduce logistic movements. You don't need to bring it in the sampling booth. You don't need to bring it back from the sampling booth back in the quarantine area. Um, you reduce significantly the sampling booth activities. Of course, you see, you know, all this opening, sealing, of course, all sampling, vial. And these are all costs which are um, popping up. I'm sure you have these costs in mind when you think about raw material testing. Consumables, garbing, all these things is, is gone. And of course, all type around um, prepping and cleaning of, of sampling rooms, which should be done after using them. This is all over. Um, when you when you want. The other one, of course, is exposure hazardous chemicals. So if you don't need to open them, your people don't need to to breathe anything. Of course, they have some some masks. In Corona, we have even everybody has using these masks. But you you see all these things in not non opening things gives a, a benefit here. Reduce product spoilage, of course, logically. If you have air sensitive material, if you don't need to open it, it helps you a lot. If you think about um, sterile productions, if you have some things which you do, really don't need to open or don't want to open, yes, this works quite nice. And we see the effect of customers um, reducing stock. So instead of having a lot of stock just to, to have the production running, you just order it, check it, and bring it in the production area. So just uh, remembering, so the a normal handheld, which you have now, polyethylene bags, yes, um, clear vials, yes, brown is already difficult for some of these Oops, excuse me, wrong direction. And the VAYA can do all of this. So we can do this um, brown bottles with this polyethylene, probably FIBC sacks. I'm not sure if you have these. Um, brown paper sacks, white paper sacks, different paper sacks, um, barrels like this and white. The more difficult are these blue guys here. So this is why we see from green, very easy to, to, to red, more difficult. Um, this is something which is, is depends a bit more on what is inside. So how good is the material Raman scattering? So just quickly, some key hardware features of the instrument. Number one, as I said, fast analysis in seconds, sometimes one, two seconds, sometimes maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Again, depends on how is strong is the material Raman active and how thick is um, the, 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 the packaging. Dedicated laser button. So if you press this button and, and you press the nose against your material, this is the double the double um, safe, safety, then the laser will start to work. Quick swap battery and USB connectors. So you can connect it to a USB and you can quickly swap between batteries. As I said, we have a, a NIST traceable system. So this is a check test piece which you can plug in before your batch, which you can plug in after your batch, automatically guided to do this. Then the instrument will, with a NIST traceable um, test standard, check that your, your Raman system is working fine. As I said, pass and fail. So you get either a green pass or a red fail, which I'm pretty sure 99.99% it will be green pass. The strap for ergonomic handling, of course, if you, hand it, if you hold it the whole day in your hand, it's, it's helping you a bit. And it has a chemically resistant keypad. So even if something gets on, you can um, wipe it away with isopropanol or typical 
um, cleaning solvents. Wi-Fi, as I said, we can do a Wi-Fi connection or we can make a connection with a cable. The source technology I explained to you in detail already. So we make a zero offset and the spatial offset. And we have the barcode scanner sitting here. So this is when you have this barcode on your raw material. I perfectly would recommend to do this and combine it with this method. And then you then they don't then you don't need to, to look for the method for for the glycerol. And you just measure the barcode and then you get the, the right method. With the VIA, the VIA, VIA comes in a big paley case. I'm not sure if you, you know them. They are black and you can throw them in the in the sea if you like. They are water resistant, water safety. But you also have some, some bottle adapters. So if you have different size of bottles in your raw material testing, some light shielding if needed or some vial holders, shoulder strap, you know, to put it around your shoulder and some safety googles well we are using a laser you need to use laser googles for this and we have some some ethernet dongle um to, to connect and we have the battery charger with the which the second battery so as i said we can have a, the, a batch mode and the batch mode really can set up so that the person running this is fully guided to do what he should do so there could be some custom instructions so what to do and um, with this um, device or do well, in some, let's say a card box, if you have many card boxes, the card boxes are too thick. The card boxes are probably, I don't know, 15, 12, 13 millimeter thick. Well, they are too big. But the blue barrels, sometimes you need to open them as well. If you have a grow media for bacteria inside, for sure the, the, the Raman is not um, strong enough here. If you have something like this, you can get even a, a small animation. You know, you need to press this against your bottle, and then you need to press the button. And then you get um, you know, your pass and fail things. It's compliant to all our trail things, as I said, 21. And you can even, even make this, this batch um, method, a batch, batch mode things here. And the wizard bait method development, I said already. So the key thing, much, much faster. Of course, the, the way um, pharma is going is to go to 100% identification um, and not anymore root n plus one. Of course, it decreases your, your money because you don't need to open things, it protects your staff, and you get um, things quicker in production. I have some examples. I don't want to go through too many, but I think we still have a bit of time um, and where you can see some spectra. So there's a citric acid in a white PE bottle. So you see the zero offset. Um, you see the, um, sorry, the zero, um, the, the offset, and the source. And you see immediately that this is nicely done so you can see the the citric acid can be done easily a, a bit more difficult and the red one again is the zero so this is what you would get with any handheld raman system on this planet you get noise why is it noise yes because the, the laser on one side but also the the sensitivity and everything and the fluorescence of the paper and the diffusive scattering of the of the of the laser signal gives you just noise or more or less noise the offset, the green one, so this is when you see the, um, the zero offset. So when we spatially offset, you see already the nice spectrum. And when you subtract this from each other, you get the, the source signal, easily to identify the EDTA in brown paper sacks. Um, dextrose monohydride, again, you see, uh, let's say, a shitty or not ideal spectrum in the zero offset. Um, you can see a nice spectrum in the offset and the, 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 um, the source signal. Is good enough to check an easily dextrose monohydride. Another one, FIBC sex. As I said, FIBC is also not a problem. Um, so we are we are getting this quite um, quickly, and we get these zero offset and source signals depicted. And just as a reference, you see from a wrap ID. As I said, I will show you later on the the wrap ID data, and the wrap ID is the let's say the precursor or the first unit using rep ID, you will see it's a bit bigger. It's a bit bigger than, than this one, but you see this is the signal where you can see the um, to, to identify. And last but not least from the VIA, um, we see that even blue barrels are working. We are, even, even us have been astonished about this because blue barrels are already difficult for the rep ID, which is a bit more powerful. But even for this guy, this was, I guess, again in, in Korea, um, this was Doxo flying inside, and we got this nice spectrum here, so it works. And we've been, all the customers have been quite happy to see that they don't need to open the blue barrel, that you get the, 
the, the zero and the offset and the source signal so they can identify what is inside of, of this blue barrel. Yeah, the batch functions, as I said, you can make a full batch, you can interrupt a batch, you can, re you know, you can do all this work and process things. Um, so this is something which is important. If you have several, ideally, um, if you have a lot of raw material, you need to test a lot. Of course, the idea is to have several um, vias in your warehouse. Um, and then if you have on one warehouse area, maybe this type of um, methods, and in the other one, you have different methods, everything is stored on a server. And then you have a method master folder where all the, the instrument and methods are, for example, in included. You know, after upload of the method, it can be revalidated re for compliance, and you can upload your methods easily. As I said, the networking works um, with a LAN cable, for example. So you can connect it to to a LIMS um, integration where you have SQL searchable XML files you can upload, and this this makes it quite easy to have um, your your raw material under control. That's all around via, so the, the connection um, in, with it with a LAN cable is is of course included. And then we're coming to the rep ID. As I said, this is the pre-version from the via. So the rep ID is in the market already for more than 10 years, something like that, 10, 12 years. So relatively shortly after Pavel Matusek has developed this um, source effect. Um, this instrument came out and we have this all over the world at different pharma companies using the rep ID already successful and the handheld via is maybe the the new generation if you like but still the rep ID exists we're still selling it because for some circumstances the, the rep ID is still used again saving time and money to raw material through all this packaging you see it's a bit different so you have a box here you have a, um, a pass and fail thing as well you have a a touch screen where you make all the entries and um, you have a barcode scanner as well everything is a bit bigger if you like but also we have this container adapters for different um, diameter um, vials of course it's 21 cf particular compliant and you measure through different materials again here's some examples this was dextrose and multi-layer paper sex so a relatively old data a couple of years old conventional rama this is what you get with your existing thing this is what you get with source. Phenol, crazol, difficult to, to differentiate, expensive. The people don't want to open it because it's for sterile production in Denmark, I think. Um, easy to differentiate and then quickly to differentiate with the with the Raman. Ovidon, copovidon, if you use NIR now, for sure impossible to, to differentiate with NIR. NIR anyway has a lot of well challenges in the using. I'm sure you're aware of this. And we see a clear trend that people get rid of any handheld NIR and they're going more to Raman just because it's more specific and um, has more advantages. Glycerol and HDPE barrels, easily to identify even if the thickness here is already probably in the in the higher millimeter range. Tech 10 seconds it takes here, so a bit longer than maybe for, for thinner for thinner barrels. Lactose in, in FIBC, easily to be done. Conventional gives you a lot of fluorescent signal already. And so the question is one rep ID and via. Well, ideally, the via, as I said, is more modern, but still we are selling the rep ID for high volume products. You know, if you have 10, 30, 50, 60,000 of, of glucose or, or yeah, paper sacks in your warehouse to check in a year, for sure the rep ID will be quicker because it can read quicker through difficult packaging. Um, for most challenging combinations, you know, the, the rep ID has a bit more power and a bit more sensitivity. Not a lot. As I said, we've been astonished that we can measure blue barrels with the VIA. And when the speed is critical, when you have so many things to do and the speed is really the key driver for you, yes, the rep ID is um, interesting. VIA is more broad, you know, it can do a lot. We can test out if it works for your type of raw materials or no. Um, of course, it can identify protocols with freedom of movement is essential. You know, you can do, you can move everywhere. You can climb, uh, and you know, some 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 hill, not, yeah, on side of a warehouse, and you you take it everywhere. And of course, it's much smaller than the other one, and you don't have any cable. So this one is a cable. You can't see it here, but there's a cable to 220 volts normally. Um, this one is of course cable free. Yes, what I made here, what we made some time back, this is for the wrap ID, but it more or less fits to the via as well. So it depends 
everything on your raw material in combination with the packaging. And if we say from left to right, the packaging gets more difficult. So PE, everybody can do. Blue barrels and then the bigger barrels more difficult. APIs, good round scatterers, calcium carbonate, and then some salts, rare, very good. Liquids, a bit less, sugars, lactose, mannitols. In the mid range, the, the weaker salts, you know, like um, uh, magnesium chloride and things are less. Gelatin, HPMC, and growth media, difficult. And then you get something like a, a yeah, yeah, I say a, a mask or um, a matrix, maybe is the better world. Um, and the matrix gives you a big green area, some yellow areas and some red areas, which we know that it doesn't work. So if you're interested in, in having a via and starting the process with Dr. Golik, we recommend um, to give us a list of your raw material, not necessarily all your raw materials, maybe the, the top, uh, let's say the, the high volume, in, the high volume um, raw materials or the critical ones or the important ones. If you like, you can send us even a bigger list. And ideally we are getting 25 kilograms glucose triple, triple layer paper, 25 liter glycerol white barrel, card box, I don't know, 100 kilo transparent polyethylene inside. So even if you have something which has a triple or, or, or double layer, so maybe a card box and in the card box is a black polyethylene and in the black polyethylene is a white polyethylene. All these information are needed because card boxes don't work, metal drums don't work, metal, let's say metal layers inside of a packaging don't work, the metal is just blocking the laser. But we can give you relatively quickly back like a like a traffic light green yes we know it works yellow poo, difficult to say we must check it or we make maybe some experiments on your side or you can ship us um, your your material in the package and red sorry we don't it doesn't work we just need to open the card box um no, normally always needs to be opened but the let's say the triple paper layer very often paper sacks very often we can measure and last but not least, and I hope then we have, let's say, roughly 15, 20 minutes, depending on your time um, time left um, for questions, is the TRS-100. So the TRS-100 is doing something completely different. So the TRS-100 number one is a really big box. So this is a big box where you need at least four people to put it on your bench. It's roughly 200 kilograms. And what it is, it's, it's an instrument to extremely fast high throughput content uniformity in polymorph analysis system. Um, so the idea is really the fastness and the non-destructive um, type of analysis you're doing. Transmission Raman is not difficult, so it's something else than source. Transmission Raman is something where you do, <clears throat> and we use again an 830 nanometer laser, you have a tray and on this tray you're placing your tablets you would like to test. 200, 300, 100, 10, whatever you would like to do. And because not all your tablets have the same size, we have a, a laser spot size aperture. So for small tablets, you need a smaller tray, logically, and you need um, a smaller laser spot so that you don't overfill your, your tablet. And then we have a very high performance collecting optics, really out of, let's say, space, space performance, if you like, and an extremely high um, performance spectrograph with a CCD detector to, to analyze the, yeah, the spectrum around 830 nanometer plus minus a bit. So it's a um, visible NIR detector. And this is what you do. So you put your laser through your tablets and because we have a, so, such a powerful laser and such a good optics here, we can do this. And what you're getting, and this is the key thing, and um, we are getting the fingerprint region of your tablet, of your molecules inside of your tablet, inside of your sample. So which means we can say what is inside, which chemical composition inside. So the, the concentration, if you like, on of your API or if your APIs, plural, in your tablet without dissolving, without HPLC, without solvents, liners, garbage, whatever. But we also get the phonone region. And inside of the phonon region, you get the crystal structure information. So if you have APIs inside of your tablets, which has different polymorph crystallization forms, I'm sure you're struggling or at least not easy to handle and to see if the right crystal structure is inside of your tablet or not. Because of course, 
if you dissolve it in in your in your for your HPLC analysis, the crystal structure is gone. So what we're doing, as I said, we are. Oops, excuse me. This was too quick. Um, I think I need to wait a bit. How is this work? Ah, so now the laser, the red is the laser. It's going through your tablet, um, <clears throat> passing through your tablet, walking through the tablet even through your shells and through your um, coatings, and it goes to the detector. And the tip tablet can be even up to 10 millimeter thick. So the laser is, is powerful, the detector is sensitive, and we can measure through this as well. So if you like, um, the laser scatters through the tablet. So it goes in the surface, and because the laser is finding their way, if you like, through the tablet, we have the collecting lens, and it goes to the detector. And this is because it goes through the whole volume, you can see this uh, underneath here. It goes through the whole volume. This is why it is much more sensitive than any backscattering or traditional laser, because the traditional Raman systems, the backscattering type, they are just measuring a bit of the surface and, of course, a bit inside. We are measuring everything. This is why we are so sensitive. We can do what we can do. Just an example, Amsudafade, which is a high fluorescent color shell here and paracetamol inside. This is what you get with the conventional Raman, it's mainly fluorescence from the, from the fluorescent color shell. And this is what you get from the transmission Raman. So we can see inside a bit similar to, to, to the raw material, but we're doing something completely different because we use this for content uniformity and also for concentration of, of APIs. Well, we, we use this, I think we can skip this because we did this already. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe, sorry, one thing. Well, we use Raman, it gives you a fingerprint. We know this, it's better specific than NIR. So there's also NIR spectroscopy to do this tablet analysis, but it's it's fast and gives you a higher specificity. So we don't have the broad overtones and it's insensitive to moisture content and particle size. So it's much more robust um, to get um, methods out for um, in comparison to NIR. Relatively inexpensive and adapted by the regulatory. So all the TRS-100 are adapted um, by the regulatory um, authorities. So we have 30, 30 meter nanoliters, fingerprint, non-destructive. You know, you can even analyze your tablets after the TRS measurements um, without any problem. Blah, 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 spot measurement. This is for content uniformity. Of course, it can be used for formulation development. So we have customers first putting a unit in the R&D and later on, I'm putting it in a in a QC environment. A 30 mm laser, so there are different laser excitations. As I said, during my first part of my talk, as we use a 30 nanometers because, well, the lower you go to the right, the less, um, well, the less weaker scattering you get because it's lumped up, um, up to the far fourth. Um, so you get less, um, less scattering from your Raman signal, a bit more than 1064, this is why we choose 830. But you see this one here, this is your fluorescence, your fluorescence interference. And this is a typical problem with, with Raman, especially in, in the range of here, that you get a lot of fluorescence and to, to, to interrupt or to, to suppress the fluorescence is not so easy. So what can we put inside? Well, all type of tablets, including coating, hard shields, capsular, side color, soft shield capsulars, vials with liquids with suspensions you know the the, the people doing and developing formulations they took maybe free powder sacks and ziploc bags and even um, high throughput um, 96 well plates could fit in and for this variety of samples of course we have the variety of trays so we can have different trays if you have a specific size of your tablet we make your own tray fitting to your tablets easily this is well quite often used so that the customers are getting their own trays you have 300 square centimeter active sampling area so you have a lot of you have a lot to place um, here so as I said mainly content uniformity um, testing is in inside of production is the key thing of course everything when you have a lot of samples when you have a high throughput screening and when you have a lot of samples to test the advantage of measuring let's say 10 seconds for one tablet without any liquids and things in comparison to maybe 10 minutes on a UPLC. This is a significantly faster way. And of course, everything around solid state. So if you think about polymorph crystallization forms, this is something which you really get maybe access with XRD or NMR, solid state NMR, but not no other technique gives you this one. 
um, a small comparison when you say you have a TRS method, um, you, you are really fast and significantly faster than, than anything which, which an HPLC can do. But still, it is nothing to, to compete really against an HPLC analysis. It's more an add-on when you need more, let's say, more cap capacity in your, in your time, uh, sorry, capacity in your lab and um, saving times. And of course, you need little or, or very little skilled user to operate this. So it can measure hundreds of samples per hour. So the, the idea is more that they're working together because not everything can be done on the TRS-100. So not every tablet, not every dosage form can be used. So it's not to replace, it's more to, you know, or the, the LC is still for impurities, it's still for injectables or very low dosage forms, maybe hormones. They are just the TRS not sensitive enough. It's an alternative, um, of course, for CU, but also for SAID. Low fast analysis, you know, we, you do for high volume testing. If you have a couple of hundred samples to test or even more, this is a good alternative. Of course, um, some other things can be done as well with the TRS-100 RTRT and the polymorph concentration or polymorph things can be done as well. So if you compare this a bit, so HPLCs, you need people, you need a lot of analysis, you maybe need to dissolve it, you need to filter it, it's destructive and you need consumables and liquids, where the TRS, and here you see the old color, so Cobalt, this was the company we bought um, three years ago, has a, used a red color here always. No sample prep, you put it non-destructive, 10 to 60 seconds per sample, fully automated, and it's of course very economical. And there are some nice um, videos showing how quickly and this pays off, if you like, because if you compare it with a traditional setup, it's relatively quickly that you get, well, that you earn money with every run because um, all these consumables and destructive things are, are not happening. And with this, I'm done. Um, 50 minutes, this was my, my time I was thinking about. So I'm really happy to get some questions either in the chat box in Hebrew or in English to me, or you can send something. Um, and with this, I'm done. Um, so we sorry. already have in, a question in the chat. Oh, you very good. So, yeah, yeah. Can you... you can try to, can, can you see it? Um, yes, I think I can see it, but let me have a look, chat. Can I see the chat? Yes. So the question is, does the ability to detect fibers used in the textile industry, such as wool, cotton, poly, um, well, so fiber in, in a package, I think the question is, the Raman in general can detect fibers. This device I've, sh I've, I've shown, let's say the, the, the VIA, is to measure something in a package or to measure raw material to test, is this, this raw material? Um, of course, wool and cotton and polyester, and they give a Raman signal, but are you interested in seeing inside of a, let's say, polymer bag, if this is polyester inside, I think the question is more a bit in this direction. Is it a raw material you would like to test? Or, or you know, or how, how does, but in general, the, the, the polymers or this one um, in a suite, phew, the material itself, no, the, well, the, the, the via is for raw material verification of pharmaceutical compounds. I would say in a suite, no, I think this is the via wouldn't fit here. Maybe the what, what we have seen <laughs> to answer you in a textile, what we have done quite interesting, if you remember my first slide today was I was speaking about the quantum cascade laser, the 8700 LDIR, which is a, an imaging system to do things. And what we did for the textile industry, we measured different mixtures textiles. So it's, a, it's like an imaging system for FDIR. But we use this to, to say, is this really 30% silk, 10% elastan, and 50% cotton? We can give you the answer in a minute from a whole piece of textile. Where are the different layers, the different fibers? Is the ratio correct? And we've we sold already systems for customers interested in this application, so textiles, and to identify quickly textile mixtures, um, even or down to a one micron, um, one micron spatial resolution, but it's not so much for the VIA. I think the VIA is really more for, for, for raw material testing, um, let's say something in a package, text shows in a, in a paper, for example. 
But if you're interested in that, let me know. Send an email to Dr. Golig and we can send you some information around the textiles uh, identification and imaging capabilities. So there that is something, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. And now I think I need to make it bigger because if not. So da -da 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 -da. if we have some material package in two different containers, whether two different methods should be developed. Yes, yes, very good question. To Katya, I think Katya, no, very good question. If you have, let's say, dextrose in a polyethylene bag and dextrose in a paper, yes, you develop two methods. And as I said, the method development is relatively quickly. So I've done this myself. So it takes a couple of minutes if you have a difficult thing. So what you normally is you take your, your raw material in your polyethylene bag and you measure six to 10 or even more positions on your package. And then you build up your, your model, your method. And then you set this, this is your method for dextrose or glucose. I forgot what I said, dextrose in polyethylene. And then you have a second method for you, which you make for your dextrose in um, in your um, in your in your paper, so for each of these combinations, you normally need your own method. Yes, very good question. Okay, Zvi Koren is asking another question with the textile. So, um, yes, I would say yes. So. Let's say if we, if you remember my source idea or the source idea where you measure first the zero offset and then the spatial offset, and then you can look inside. For, um, um, see, for your, for your textile question, just to measure is this cotton and this, you can take a standard Raman handheld because uh, a normal backscattering handheld Raman from the competition would work. So if you like, we could use our one as well, but you don't need the source anymore. This is what you, if you come to money, I don't speak about this because this is Dr. Golik's work, but you, you, you pay for source where you can see inside something, but a normal backscattering Raman should, would be enough to, to analyze textiles. So the, I, I, would, I would guess that with the standard, it works fine as well. Um, our challenge or our thing is really to look behind the scenes, to look behind the paper, but it should work. I'm pretty sure when we go for, for textile analysis, yeah, there's so much fluorescence, that's a good point. So then, I like the idea um, to, to try different, I, I write it down. I like the idea, yes. I, I, I would think about um, testing out some, some different um, textiles. If this is something um, which could be done because of the fluorescence, maybe we have some advantages as well. Yeah, it's a good idea, I like, I like this. So maybe send an email to Dr. Golik with your connections um, and then we can connect together and think about if this is something where we could go and further because we're still looking in the moment for the raw material things but i have already a lot of cases because i'm doing africa as well for counterfeit um, and medical things so they're, they're, you know this is a big problem especially in africa maybe less in, in in industry nations like like israel but in these big countries and where you have more more counterfeit things this is something where we have a very interesting project where you can measure of course these this um tablets directly before it enters the country. Yes, okay. so if you, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy about the text. I like to, to think about a bit more if this works, if I can, you know, send so your, your connections and I, I connect with you. Great. Yes, so if yeah. there are some more questions popping up overnight when you sleep and think, oh, what was presented, send an email <laughs> to Dr. Golik and we, we work together on the, on the answer. Um, Yes. Absolutely. Uh, you can write to me or to Yael. Uh, I'm in the marketing mail. Just we are here for you guys. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, pleasure. It was a pleasure to host you and to raise all these questions. Just beautiful, and I'm so happy uh, that you are with us. Thank you, customers, for joining in. Yes, and I see the last question from Svi. Yes, you can download the spectra. So you can download um, oh. the, 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 the zero offset spectra, you can download the, um, the source spectra, and you can download the, the spatial offset. So, you, you know, it's zero, you can get all these and you can play then with some external programs um, what you're getting. Yes, this works. Normally it's not needed, but yes, you can. You can. Super it is. Good. 
So then, thank you. shalom. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Shalom. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good enough. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes, pleasure. Pleasure. Guten Tag. <laughs>